want you to look at your neighbor and ask, have you ever been in the right place at the right time? Have you online been at the right place at the right time? You know, maybe you were exactly where you needed to be in order to maximize an opportunity, right place, right time. Or maybe there was somebody in your life in a situation or a circumstance that they just happened to be passing through right when you needed them to be there. And it was the right place at the right time. See, I venture that we have had more of these types of experience than we would care to understand or know. And in fact, if we read this book, the Bible, it tells us that God watches over his people and that he is our banner, that he is the one who is watching. He assigns his angels so that our foot will not dash upon a rock. There is more of these moments than we would ever know because God is in control watching over his people. However, this morning, as we approach Easter, as we get ready for the Easter season, next week is Palm Sunday, and Pastor Xavier is going to bring us a word. I'm excited to hear what God puts on his heart. And so as we get ready for Palm Sunday, for Passion Week, and everything that happens in this holy time for us Christians, where we celebrate what Jesus came to do, I want us to contemplate this morning on a passing through moment before the Easter moment. I want us to contemplate before the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ coming in and the shouts of Hosanna, Jesus passes through Jericho. So I want you to open up your Bibles and go to Luke chapter 19, and we're going to jump into God's word. Luke is in the New Testament, it's one of the Gospels, the physician Luke wrote this account of many eyewitnesses and interviews of what was happening in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. So when you're there, Luke chapter 19, verse 1, say amen. All right, the rest of you, we'll give you another minute. All right, so here's the deal. I want you to prepare yourselves because Jesus is passing through. And while we have all of these moments in lives where we might be at the right place at the right time, we have moments where we were not at the right place and right time. We understand the challenge and the tragedy of what happens when we aren't in the right place at the right time. Today, I want us to look at what happens when Jesus happens to be the one passing through. What can we learn out of this passage in Luke chapter 19, which I believe is very, very applicable to you and I this day, this season. So Luke 19, chapter one, uh, sorry, verse one. Jesus entered Jericho and he was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and he was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being short, a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. We're going to dive in and unpack a few things in this passage, but I want you to just say this right now with me. This is for me. This is for me. Go ahead, say that out loud. Let your ears hear it. This is for me. Jesus is passing through. See, Passover was just a week away or so, and Jesus was going to Jerusalem for one reason and one reason only. If you go back to Luke 18, verse 31, this is the third time Jesus states this throughout his earthly ministry with his disciples. He says, he takes the 12 aside and he says, we are going up to Jerusalem and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. What will be fulfilled? Here it is. He will be handed over to the Gentiles. Okay? So he's handed over. He will be mocked. He will be insulted. He will be spat on. He will be flogged. He will be killed. And on the third day, he will rise again. Jesus predicted his death three different times in the Gospels, and all different Gospels cover the fact, well, except for John, but Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they cover the fact that Jesus predicted his death. See, the whole purpose of Jesus being born was for him to die. The whole reason why he came into earth was so that he could die. So he was on his way to Jerusalem for the express purpose of fulfilling his life's calling to die to sacrifice himself upon that cross. Now, Jericho is a little bit out of the way. And when we read things like this, sometimes being so far removed from the context and from the geography of the land, where the Bible readers or authors assume we know the context of geography, 
That's not just a throwaway statement. It says, Jesus passed through Jericho. If you were going from where he was to Jerusalem, Jericho was not the direct path. You should have gone straight through Samaria. Yet Jesus decided to go off the beaten path, to go out of his way, to spend some time in Jericho. And I'm convinced that he went all the way out of his way because he knew that little short Zacchaeus was hanging out in Jericho. See, Jesus passed through. Why? Because he knew there was a need for him there. A man in that place might have been grappling with an anaconda. Not literally, but in his heart and his mind, figuratively. He might have been in a desperate situation that was in deep need of somebody passing through to meet him in his situation. There are no accidental miracles with Jesus, church. Jesus is intentional everywhere he goes. And similarly, there's a purpose for you being here today. Whoever you are, whatever you're going through in your life, for those of you who've connected to us online, maybe a friend inviting you here today, maybe somebody referred to you to our stream this morning, whether this day or down the road, after this recording, whatever it is, Jesus has a purpose for you here today. And there are no accidental accident miracles with him when you woke up this morning and decided to come to God's house God had a plan for you this morning he had an appointment with you today today is the day that God has chosen us to hear his word and to speak his truths into our hearts that can change us so let's go through this story real quick here you know I want us to take a look when Jesus passed through there's things that happen So the first thing I want you to understand, when Jesus passes through, there's an implicit fact that we have to understand, and that is that none are hopeless. Look at verse 2. This is a story of a rich tax collector who becomes a follower of Jesus, and that in and of itself is a miracle. It says, a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was wealthy. There's another scripture in the Bible that says that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And that is because Jesus is talking about the affections and the the, the, the attitudes, the pride or the dependency of a rich person when he becomes so accustomed to that resource. It's not that it's actually physically impossible, but unless if things are dealt with, are changed inside of the heart of man, there is no way that we would prefer the kingdom of God over everything the world offers. Zacchaeus was a tax collector, and he was absolutely one of the most hated people in the Bible. Why? Because at that time, tax collectors were not your best friends. And I don't know if, nothing, if anything's really changed. <laughs> How many of you are best friends with your IRS buddies? You just send them care packages in the mail and you write cards and you your pen pals. How many of us love our tax reps? Right? Tax collectors in the day, they were not the greatest people. They were not of the best character. They weren't the ones that people lauded as the most noble of society's figures and everybody thought that here is this man Zacchaeus not only a tax collector but the chief of tax collectors this guy had other tax collectors probably reporting to him he was the most prestigious the most well-known the most you know reputable within his community and you want to know a funny thing about Zacchaeus if you look at the root word of his name Zacchaeus if you look at that it means righteous one So imagine that mom and dad names this little boy, and parents, we we realize in the Bible, names are important. They have significance. There's prophets who name their children certain things to be a sign and a witness to a whole nation. God came and he changed Abram's name to Abraham. Why? Because he wanted him to be the father of nations through his faith. He changed Jacob, who was named deceiver, into Israel because he wanted to divorce him of that name, deceiver, and give him a name that was redemptive. There is power in a name. So imagine mom and dad named this man Zacchaeus, pure one. And everybody walking around, seeing him around town in Jericho. Hey, pure one. Yeah, right. (laughs) This guy's the biggest crook and swindler there is. 
He's skimming off the top on everybody's taxes. Why? Because tax collectors would tax you on everything. There's a poll tax, an income tax. There's a tax if you ride your donkey. There's a tax if you decide to eat outside of your house. There's a tax for you to do this and that. So you're breathing here, pay me a tax. There was a tax for everything. And the tax collectors were not liked. Why? Because not only did they take the tax that Rome demanded... Here's a Jewish man who is under the authority of the Roman government. Why? Because Rome is in power during this time and Israel is subject underneath their power. They are not autonomous or sovereign. So here's a man who works for the oppressors, the Romans, and he takes taxes to give to Rome. I don't like that to begin with. But on top of that, he goes and he adds an additional tax so that he can line his pockets. And it tells us Zacchaeus was a really wealthy man. So do you kind of have an idea here? This is not a person that people enjoyed. This is not the kind of person that you say, yeah, I made plans. We're going to hang out this weekend. Who's coming? Oh, Zacchaeus is coming. We're going we're to go do this. He's not the person that anybody wanted to hang out with. So here we have a hopeless case. We have somebody who's an outcast, somebody that by society standards nobody wants, nobody invites, has no friends, and probably is a person that is suffering a lot of loneliness. He is a person who is rejected, that people are hostile towards. Nevertheless, those whom the world deemed to be worthless, those whom the world deemed to be hopeless, those whom the world deemed to be outcast and unwanted, Jesus Christ says, I'll take them. And I praise God for that because he picks the lowly things of this world to confound the wise. He is the one that goes after and leaves the 99 to go after the one who is lost. That is Jesus Christ. And so Jesus goes out of his way because of the implicit fact that there are none who are hopeless. Friends, I don't know who you are and what you've gone through in your life. Or, you know, I know some of you and, and, and the stories of what God has done in your life and the testimonies, but there might be situations and circumstances where you fail to meet the mark or things are not the way that you think should be or people don't applaud certain things in your life or they've discarded you and rejected you in certain ways and said that you're not going to amount to anything or do anything or you're never going to break out of this mold or, or be accepted in this way and, and, and whatever that might be, I want you to understand that there is a God who says, you are worthwhile to me. That he leaves the comfort of eternity to come into human flesh for the express purpose to die, to reconcile you. He goes out of his way to reach those who are outcasts. For some of us, it might be we have friends, we have loved ones, colleagues, we have neighbors, we have family. And we look at their lives and what they've made of their lives, the decisions that they've made. It's just one poor act after another, one bad choice after another, one terrible habit after another, and their lifestyle is just a wake of destruction and pain. Bridges are burnt. The future seems dire and lost. There seems to be no hope for them. But friend, I want you to do it to know. That with Jesus Christ, you should never give up hope. And so if you've got a friend who just seems to be so hostile to God, there's a loved one who just seems to be so broken and lost and chained in the lifestyle or a situation, in a pain and a depression, and whatever it might be, that seems to be so far away from what you could ever do to help and reach them, I want you to never give up in praying for them. Never give up in praying for that husband who will not come home, for that husband who will not stop his addictions or whatever, for that son and daughter who has been estranged, for whatever situation that you might have, that brother who's addicted to those drugs and will never seem to, to break free from the sway of that addiction. Never stop praying. Because Jesus goes out of his way to meet, and there's no accidental miracles. So I don't know if that's for you this morning, or if that needs to recharge your heart today to start praying again. I want you to right now just lift up your hand and say, Lord, forgive me. Lord, forgive me for giving up hope when you are the one that says there is no hopeless cause. Secondly, 
Not only is there an intrinsic fact that none are hopeless here, when Jesus passes through Jericho, there's a hook that I see here, and it's called curiosity. Verses 3 and 4. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. I venture to say he's not only running ahead of the crowds to get up a tree and see Jesus. I'm pretty sure that uh, maybe in the crowd of people in this mosh pit that's going to be this procession and Jesus is coming through. Oh, look, there's Zacchaeus. I hate that guy. Maybe he's running up a tree to get away from the crowd and, and be, you know, avoiding a kick or two or a jab or a nudge or whatever it might be. Why? Because... Here's a courageous man who knows the crowd hates him. The people don't want to receive him. He's an outcast and rejected, despised and not wanted. He is venturing to be among the crowd to see Jesus. Why? Because he's curious. So he climbs a sycamore tree so he can see Jesus. So he can catch a glimpse. See, curiosity brought him to that day. I've heard stories about this man. I've, I've heard of miracles and things that he said, things that go against the grain, and people are following him. There's crowds amassing around this Jesus. And some say he turned water into wine. He healed a blind man when he was walking through. He, he casted out demons and did all this kind of stuff and, and crazy things that you would not have expected. He speaks like one with authority, and the crowds are just amassing. Asking, who is this man? Curiosity brought him to see Jesus Christ. But one thing that I want to consider is this, that I don't think that it was just trying to avoid the crowds. He climbs a tree, trying to see Jesus because he heard some cool things. But I think that deep down inside of him, he felt what it says in Ecclesiastes, that inside the heart of man, God has hidden eternity. Inside of this man who seems to be well off and has everything that he might need, he is wealthy, he's well set, he's got everything to gather. He's got money up the wazoo and he can do what he needs to do. He's got people reporting to him, power and prestige. He's got all of this other stuff, yet this man is a man who's lonely and who's contemplating, is there more to life than this? So curiously, he says, I've heard things about Jesus. There's people who are, you know, he's livening and firing up their hearts. I need to find out more about this man. He climbs a tree to see Jesus. Why? Because curiosity saw him there. See, inside of us, there's this awareness that there has to be more to life than just this. There has to be more to life than just going through the motions. And if we're honest, we all get to a point in our lives when we experience this. We might have a goal or a project or a dream of ours. And then we, we work hard and we pursue that with all our hearts. And when we finally achieve that dream or that goal, if it, you know, at that moment, maybe it is everything we've wanted it to be. But sometimes we realize it's not everything it was cracked up to be. And we start to wonder, is there more to life than this? See, I got to believe there's more to life than just getting up and going to work every day. There's more to life than just going and buying a house. There has to be more to life than just buying a car. There has to be more to life than just getting into a relationship. There has to be more to life than just raising a child. There has to be more to life than just this. Why? Because it tells us that we are but a vapor in this world. There has to be more to life than just this life. And Zacchaeus had that curiosity within him. See, the greatest, the richest person, the most prestigious person, the most successful person apart from Jesus Christ, he's empty. And you know what? I'm not here to say that rich people don't have fun. They do. They got options, okay? But one thing I will say There is eternity written in all of our hearts. And after we've had all of the money, all of the fame, all of the power, all of the success, and all that other stuff, things that we are all on different journeys in life pursuing and doing, there's going to come a point in a place where we have to say, is there more to life than this? Because Jesus says it's appointed once for man to live, and then there is judgment. There is a life after this life. And he has gone away to go prepare a place so that we would be with him. There is more to this life. And so Zacchaeus climbs a tree and he's looking. 
Have you encountered anybody in your life who's been burned out over experiences, pursuing this and that and chasing the next thing and they're looking for the biggest, the baddest, the, 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 mess, the best, the next and you know they're going from one thing to another yet the inside is empty. They're still looking for that meaning. See, they go from this relationship to buying this, from this job to that job, from this experience to that experience, from this riches and fantasies and pleasures, and they're chasing to a point where they become bitter and become bored and become just desensitized with what's happening around them. Jesus has come that we would not get to this point, but at that point, though, I want to just encourage the, the genius that Jesus embeds in our hearts. When he passes through, he allows those moments in our lives to make us curious. Just a little curious. Will you climb that tree today? Just a little curious. If you find yourself in that place, like, what is next? What's the meaning? Will you make yourself climb up that tree to be just a little curious? I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but I remember when I was in high school, um, there used to be, you know, I was a, I've been a Christian ever since I, I could remember. You know, we'd go to church, I'd sleep under the pews, I'd sleep on the pews, I'd sleep on my stepdad, I'd sleep on my, what, I just slept at the church as a kid because the church was long and we'd stay there from seven to about midnight. It, that was just how it went, all right? And there was no choice, hey, Brian, do you want to go to church today? It's like, get your booty in the car, we're going to church. That's what it was. And so, you know, from ever since I could remember, I grew up in church. And so, you know, during high school, oftentimes I would hear people say to me as my friends, and and I was around so many other people who, you know, didn't know God or didn't go to church or all that kind of stuff. They said, there's something different about you. You ever ever encounter that when somebody who does not yet know Jesus, they see Jesus in you and they say, what is it that's different about you? There's something attractive and appealing. It's the light of the world and the salt of the earth that's within us that Jesus calls us to be that becomes attractive to the world. Have you ever worked with somebody and you say, you know what, I know that they're going through the rat race and the motions and all that, but there's something different about them. They're always joyful. They're always hopeful. There's always like a pep in their step. There's, there's always something that is different. I quite can't place it. But there's something there that's interesting to me. And that's where Zacchaeus was that day. Zacchaeus was there. This morning, some of you might be there. You might be curious. You might be going through something. There might be a challenge or a situation where you're like, I can't believe that this is what I'm experiencing. There has to be more than this. I got to be able to get out of this and move past this. If that's you, I want you to know that there's a plan in God as he passes through to make you curious. When I look back on my life, there was a period of time I was going through a very difficult upset. And I met a lady who had gone through a very similar upset. She had gone through a very disastrous relationship. And you know what? In that circumstance, though she had gone through everything that I had gone through in a way, it was very similar. Our circumstances just flipped the characters. Um, I looked and I observed her life. And though she had gone through something similar to me, she wasn't bitter. She wasn't angry. She wasn't down and out. She was actually hopeful. She was filled with joy. She was filled with hope. And, you know, as I looked at your sister, Mark, and I'm like, what is going on? You've gone through this very upsetting relationship, and yet you're talking about how you care for this person who hurt you so badly. I wasn't experiencing that, and I wanted to hurt. Give the tax collector a kick. But it made me curious. Why is she like that? And it got me curious to go to her house to find out when she was having a Bible study and inviting others to come through. I wanted to be there and find out how do you feel the way you feel? Why do you believe the way you believe? How have you come out of that circumstance the way you did? What do you have that I don't understand and I don't have? See, God allows the curiosity. Today, if you are curious, I want you to just be ready as Jesus passes through. Number three, it tells us here in verse five, when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and he said, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house. When Jesus passes through, there's an intrinsic fact that none are hopeless. There is a a definite, a definite curiosity that is there. 
an, a hook that he uses to grab our attention, but there is an invitation, and that is for relationship. Jesus invites us to real relation. Zacchaeus, I am coming up here, and I want you to come down so we can go to your house. When Jesus shows up in Jericho, Amidst the crowds, things are happening. People are all around him. He stomps before the sycamore tree. And it's not Zacchaeus who shouts out, King, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. It is Jesus who stops, looks up, and calls him by name. Zacchaeus, come down. There's an invitation that Jesus makes. Come down because I want to eat at your place. And at this, this little tax collector... I think about this man. He gets so excited. He comes down that tree. He says, oh, giddy. Oh, yes, I'm excited. You want to go to my house? All right, let's go to my my house for real? Like, really? Nobody wants to come to my house. Nobody wants me in their house. You've come out of your way. You want to come to my place. And he didn't say, let's go. We're going to Bertucci's. We're going to this restaurant. I want to go into your house, Zacchaeus. See, church, what I want us to understand in this place, and I'm taking way too much time, is the fact that every single one of us have been at the sycamore tree. We've been in this tree figuratively. We've been in a place where Jesus has passed on through, and he stops, he looks right at us, and he says, Hey, Mark. Hey, Lillian. Hey, Maria. I want to come home to your house. I want to come home to your house. Will you come down from your tree? And at that point, we need to have humility. We need to have our pride take a back seat. We need to let go of every one of our apprehensions and our roadblocks. We have to let go of every one of the past uh, insults and stigmas and labels and whatever it is that we're going through, every impossibility and excuse, every opposition. We have to let it go at that place and we make a decision. Why? Because there's an invitation for relationship. Jesus said, I want you to come down so I can go and have dinner at your house. How many of you have stopped to realize that that's very personal? Going into someone's home is a very personal thing. It's a very intimate thing. Not everybody gets invited to come home. Sometimes we should invite more people to come to our home, and we're just so busy, but not everyone gets to come home. And so in this scenario, Jesus says, look, I want to come in. And the word that he says, today I want to stay at your place, the word he uses is the word abide. I want to abide in your house. That means I want to remain in your house. I want to stay long term in your house. I'm not just passing through. Yes, I passed through to Jericho, but Zacchaeus, I'm not passing through anymore. I want to stay with you. That's very intimate. Some people, they don't realize that invitation. And when We hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. We miss the fact that what he's inviting us to is real, authentic, natural relationship. He wants us to allow him in. He wants to come into our homes and make himself at home. You ever been to someone's house and you don't even have to ask to open the refrigerator? Because you guys are just so at home. There's such a bond and a relationship there that you can just open up the fridge and it's okay? You ever been in those type of relationships? Yeah, you know, you go to mom's house, you go, you go to your family's house, you, you don't have to be all like waiting for them to invite you to do something. You take off your shoes, you, you kick back, you relax, right? Jesus says, I want to come to your house and make myself at home. How many of us have, you know, realized that we miss this fact? We, we, we come into this all of a sudden relationship with Jesus and he comes into our lives and comes into our homes and all of a sudden we're very tense around him. Ever met people who are tense around Jesus? They're very tense around God. You know, the, whenever they come to serve him or pray, they get super tense. They, all of a sudden they change their voice. Oh, God. Lord Jesus, please. And they bust out the thesaurus when they talk to him. Thou, Lord, please have mercy on thee and me and all of... It's all of a sudden the relationship got all strained and stressed. It got tense. 
But Jesus says, I want to come to your house and I want to make myself at home. See, when I talk to my son, I don't go, oh, Micah. Oh, honey, dearest. Sweetie, how's it going? How was your day? Come here, my boy. And I talk to him naturally. Why? Because he wants to be at home with dad. I need to be at home with my wife. If I'm not, pretty soon that's going to be a very weird relationship. If we are tense around each other all the time. See, God wants a natural, free-flowing relationship with you and me. We don't need to bust out the thesaurus and get a bigger dictionary in order to talk to him. He wants us to just keep it simple and keep it honest and keep it coming back. That we would always be before him. That's the natural, sustained relationship that he wants with us. Now, many of you, you start out that way. Many of us, we start with this just natural acceptance of Jesus. And we're so tender because he's come into our lives and changed us and met us in such a drastic way. And things are changing. Things are intimate and exciting. But then, you know, along the course of time, things drift. We start getting more and more, you know, legalistic. We start saying that we have to follow this rule and that rule and do this and that. And then we put all of these tension and strains on the relationship that was meant to be very intimate and passionate. Jesus wants us, like a marriage, to stay intact. Like a marriage, think about this. How often does this happen? It starts off, you know, a guy looks at a girl with all googly eyes. And it's just like, oh, she's just wonderful. And it's just so sweet and rainbows and butterflies and you just want to be with each other all the time. And then, you know, in the course of time, if couples are not committed, you know, to living out until death do us part, pretty soon they begin to drift away from each other. Communication starts breaking down and they're not actually spending that time and being natural with each other, including each other in everything. And then what was an intimate, passionate relationship becomes a legal partnership. They're just living together. They just got a partnership in in sharing responsibilities, married with certain strings attached. There's no intimacy, no connection, no warmth, no love. And you know what? What if that is what's happening with some of our relationships with God? Zacchaeus, come down. I want to come to your house. I want to abide. I want to make myself at home in your place. And what does he do? Tells us in verse 6. So he came down at once and he welcomed him gladly. Zacchaeus decided at once and for all, I'm going to end my curiosity. He's come to me, he called me by name. I'm coming to him and I'm going to say, Yes, let's go. Before he changes his mind, come to my house. Let's go. He is excited. He doesn't choose to stay up. He doesn't say, you know what, I'm actually comfortable up on this tree. I think I'm going to spend a few more days here. I'm actually away from the crowds. No one's going to hurt me up here. I'm insulated. I'm protected. I'm not going to be vulnerable around anybody. Hello, church. I'm not going to be vulnerable and open up my life to what Jesus can do and touch and change and move upon my life. So I'm going to insulate myself and put a wall around me and stay up on this tree as the invitation is coming forth to me. No, it says that he came down immediately. But then verse 7 shows up, and all the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner? Just as quickly as Zacchaeus responds, a problem arises, and people start complaining. And who are all the people? These are the crowds of people who are watching that day, who had come to see Jesus, and they are watching and interspersed in that crowd are probably Pharisees and scribes and the religious leaders of the day who did not like anything that Jesus had to say. And they start looking and pointing fingers, Jesus, you're going to his house? He's an outcast. He's a sinner. Jesus, don't you know that the law tells us that this man is so hated and despised because of what he does? He's so unmoral, immoral, that he's not allowed to go into the temple and worship. He's not allowed to. Jesus, when you come and you're hanging out with him, you're reclining at the table, talking to him, touching him, you know what's going to happen? You're going to become impure, Jesus, and you cannot be with this man. You're, you're going to defile yourself, Jesus? This man is going to hang out with a sinner. They saw Jesus opening up and they were repulsed. Do you notice the difference between attitudes? Between Jesus Christ and the crowds. See, none are hopeless in Jesus' eyes. But yet sometimes we look at people and we say, they're a lost cause. Oh, that person, forget it. I wash my hands of that person. Forget it, man. Oh, he'll never change. She'll never change. Oh, they don't deserve a chance. We judge the book by its cover. 
Yet Jesus has a different attitude. What's the point? Jesus steps up. He comes through. He passes through to a life that is not hopeless. He sees the curiosity inside of his life, and he makes an invitation to be made at home within his life, have a real relationship with him. And what happens is this, that there is the last thing that happens when Jesus passes through. There's evidence that he came through. There's evidence that he passed through, and that evidence is change. The last point is in verse 8 and 9. You know, I'll let you think about the implications of when the crowd complain, because there's, there's some, you know, the minute that we decide to follow after God's will, there's going to be people who are going to rise up and start saying a whole bunch of stuff. The minute you decide to go follow the dream that God put in your heart and, the, and the, the thing that he's called you to, your purpose, your calling, there's going to be others who are going to say, oh, you're not good enough for that. You're not equipped for that. You don't have the enough knowledge for that. Oh, you shouldn't be doing this or it's not the right time to do that. And they'll question each and everything. Yet Jesus saw Zacchaeus and said, hey, I'm coming to your house because I don't care what other people say. I serve a God that doesn't care what people say about me. He loves me. He's coming for me, and he'll change me. Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, verse 8 through 9, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Between verse 7 and verse 8, there's a lapse of time. Jesus goes to his house. And there they ate together, they talked together, they, they impacted and, and connected. And you know what, Zacchaeus comes out of that experience a changed man. So much so that, you know what, the law told him that if he had stolen from anyone, he had to make restitution and give 20% interest. Zacchaeus says, you know what, God, you've so impacted my life. I was so curious. You, you stopped and you came to me, a hopeless, reckless man, a person that is crooked and defiled. You came to me. And so because of that, Jesus, you've made yourself at home in my life. I'm going to pay back fourfold what I took from each and every person that I swindled. He said, there is something that came into my life and I have to show the evidence of that I have been changed. And I'm not going to wait till tomorrow. I'm going to do it right now. Bring out the books. Let me start making phone calls. Who are the people that I cheated? I'm going to pay them back now. How often have you heard people say, you know what, Jesus, he's concerned with my heart? Have you heard that? Absolutely, Jesus is concerned with our hearts. But how many of us have heard that? And I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard it. He's concerned with my heart. And then right after that follows an excuse and a reason why their mouth is so filthy. Right after that comes the excuse and the reason why they are living together with somebody that they're not married with. Right after that comes the reason why they are doing X, Y, Z that the Bible tells us that we shouldn't do. Why? Because Jesus has come to put parameters to bless us. I want something for you, not against you, and do this to help you. And so they are doing everything else, but Zacchaeus shows us that there has to be a change. See, church, not everybody that goes to church is a Christian. Not everybody that reads a Bible is a Christian. Not everybody who raises his hand or, 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 or opens her lips to declare God's praises is a Christian. A Christian is a title. that It's a title that must be evidence in relationship, in walk, in personal lifestyle. That's what it is to be a Christian. As Zacchaeus said to him, I will pay back fourfold. He was saying, I don't want to just have you over for dinner. You came into my home and you made yourself at home. You've impacted me and changed me. You know what? I'm going to show in the rest of my life that you are my Lord and my Savior. See, I want you to think about this. Some Christians claim to be believers, but they're not. Here's the question that would help us all to avoid that. If we were to be convicted for being a Christian, if we were to be arrested and sent to trial and they were proving that we were going to be convicted, would there be enough evidence against you to condemn you? Would there be enough evidence to convict you as a Christian? That's the question that we should ask each other. So I invite the team to come up. Zacchaeus is a great illustration of what James says. 
As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is death. See, we're not saved by our works, but when we are saved, our works will demonstrate that we are so. We're not saved because we read the Bible, because we have a relationship with Jesus and we pray and we tithe and and we follow his commandments. We don't have salvation because we do those things. We do those things because we have been saved, because he abides in us and we in him. Zacchaeus was a hopeless case in the eyes of many. Nonetheless, because of his curiosity, God saved him. And verse 10 The Son of Man came to seek and to save those whom are lost. I hope this morning that we can permanently delete a lie that the enemy would speak over our minds. See, the Bible tells us that there is an accuser of the brethren. His name is Satan. And he desires to tell us and fix in our hearts that we are to be damned. That we are to be condemned to hell. See, the reality is that Jesus... And God, Jesus came as God's instrument purchasing salvation for us. God never intended to consign any man to destruction. God never intended to send any person to hell. Matter of fact, he created hell for the devil and his angels, not for mankind. God does not desire to destroy us, but rather he desires to save us. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. The thing is, though, when something is lost, it's out of place, and our relationship with God has been lost. When Adam and Eve came into that garden and they rejected God's instructions and accepted the lies of that serpent, eating the tree of knowledge of, of, of wisdom, truth, and life, she, what she did was disobey God and introduce sin into the world, and that has misplaced us we've become lost in relationship with the lord we have no place no foundation to stand before him but though jesus wants to be our savior when he passes through i invite you to stand with me when he passes through he can very well be your savior He's passing through each and every one of our lives at some point. And today, because you're here, I say he's passing through today. And if we don't accept him as Savior, then you know what? We're going to have to accept him as our judge. If we do not accept him as the Savior that he intends to be, desires to be, then we will have to accept him as a judge. Inevitably, we must come down from the sycamore tree. We must decide to do something about this. We have to say, I'm going to let him lead me. I'm going to let him be the Lord and Savior of my life, the leader of my soul, and direct my path. I'm going to live for the Lord, and I'm going to meet him face to face. When Zacchaeus met Jesus face to face, there was a change and a transformation in his life. I'll close with this. There's years ago a story of a, of a young man who was in a busy city. He was walking down the road and going through an intersection. As he was going through, unawares of what's happening around him, he didn't know that there was a truck barreling down the highway and it was coming and it was about to hit him. All of a sudden, the hand just reaches out and yanks him back onto the curb. Dazed and confused, he looks up at the man and he looks at the road, at the blaring sound of that horn and that truck who just barely missed him. He realizes it was an older, elderly gentleman who looked very esteemed and, 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 and grandfatherly. And he, he just said, thank you, sir. You saved my life. Well, in that same city, just two weeks later, there's a young man sitting in a crowded courtroom And in that courtroom, the judgment's about to be read, the sentence's about to be given. It's a capital case where the death sentence is on the table. The young man committed a capital offense. And so the judge looks down and he says, young man, is there anything else that you'd like to say before we pass this sentence? The young man looks up at the judge and realizes who it is. And he says, yes, yes, I do. I've got something to say. It's you. Remember, just two weeks ago, you saved me. You yanked me. You pulled me up. You were my savior that day two weeks ago. Surely now you can save me again. And after that passionate plea and cry for help, a pin drop could be heard in that courtroom. 
judge opens up his mouth and he says, young man, two weeks ago, yes, I was your savior. But today I have to be your judge. Church, Jesus Christ would love to be our savior. He has made everything about his life align to accomplish that purpose. And in just two weeks, we're going to celebrate what he did and how he rose again. But if we do not come down from the sycamore tree and say, Jesus, you have to lead my life. I have to give you my heart and my life, and you have to be welcomed in to be made feel at home, not just so I can carry you on my lips or, or wear a cross around my neck, but Jesus, you have to change me. There has to be an evidence in my life so that you, know, you can look at me and say, yes, I am in relationship with you, your Savior. Only if we do that, church, will we avoid those painful words when he says, depart from me, I never knew you. Today, I've got to be your judge. With every eye closed in this place, two invitations. If you have never said yes to Jesus coming into your life, to be the Lord of your life, to, the leader, to just lead you. He's got wisdom. He's got a plan for us. He's got a purpose for us. And every single one of us have fallen short of his standards. Every one of us are outcasts when it comes to God's holiness. We've been lost out of relationship with God, each and every one of us. If you have never said, Lord, I need you to forgive me of my sins, of the brokenness within me, and lead me out so I can live. If you've never done that, I just want you to raise your hand. If you're online and you're making that decision, please hit that button. Talk to a host right now. This is your day. Jesus is passing through. If it's in this place and that's you, just raise your hand. I want to pray for you. God bless you. If you raise your hand, just say this, Jesus. You stepped out of heaven. You came to earth to live a sinless life and pay the ultimate price. Death on a cross to forgive me of my sins. Everything was laid on you. And now I can be a new person. I confess that you are Lord and you are Savior. Help me to live for you in Jesus' name. Amen.